The development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria is one of the best known examples of how natural selection, acting on random mutations, can produce microevolution at the biochemical level. The laboratory examples that we can see most clearly, um, or the examples that we can see most clearly in nature and, and, and dissect and analyze in the laboratory, are the evolution of resistance to chemical pesticides and antibiotics in insects and in bacteria, respectively. And what happens very predictably and in a very straightforward way is the evolution of entirely new traits, sometimes by the evolution of entirely new enzymes and compounds. Bacteria, for example, become resistant to penicillin. In a sense, this is evolution, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough to really provide evidence for Darwin's theory. For centuries before Darwin, domestic breeders were well aware that they could produce dramatic changes in existing species. And in the case of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, that's all we're doing, or all we're seeing. We're seeing changes within existing species. In fact, just recently, uh, a renowned British bacteriologist said that in 150 years of research, uh, although you might expect new species to appear in bacteria before they would appear anywhere else because bacteria reproduce so rapidly. In 150 years, we have seen no new species emerge in bacteria. Well, what Darwin's theory needs is those new species. Antibiotic resistance, in terms of natural selection, is an excellent example in its use. I mean, it's one of the, one of the um, hallmark examples given in, in microevolution for support of Darwinian thought. However, I think in the, in the last few years, it's got to be reinterpreted to a degree. Laboratory research shows that when an antibiotic is applied to literally billions of bacteria cells in a petri dish, a few mutated cells that happen to be resistant to that drug remain. Those few cells can then give rise to a colony of resistant bacteria. The question is, how well does this mutant strain survive in the long run? This can be measured in what scientists call fitness cost. How well does this mutant bacteria survive when the drug is removed and it now must compete with the original parent bacteria? These organisms are not able to grow with the fidelity, the robustness that the original parent did. And that's one of the things that we've been looking at. So you can take a culture of cells that are, that are sensitive to the drug played them out on petri dishes that have the drug, but there's a single colony coming up that's resistant to the drug. One cell that gave rise to this colony was resistant to the drug out of four billion. If this is the parental strain, we now have a mutant, we grow them up separately, and then we put them in the same test tube without the drug. So now we've removed selection and we can measure empirically the fitness cost in terms of how well the resistant organism can now compete with its parent. The surprising result is that in a relatively short period of time, the resistant bacteria lose out in their competition with the parent. They can't reproduce as fast and over a short time disappear. Within one or two transfers of overnights, you can lose that population of resistant cells. And then after the third transfer, the resistant isolate has been completely outcompeted by the parent. Why is the resistant strain ultimately less fit? One answer may be that the mutation that produces antibiotic resistance also damages the cell's ability to copy genetic information. It turns out that the resistant strain has a defect in its information processing system. So, these bacteria gain resistance to the antibiotic only by losing another key function they need for survival. That's why in the wild, the resistant strain would lose out to the parent type because the resistant strain is actually less efficient overall. We're going backwards in terms of the fitness of these organisms, not forwards, as used as an example of evolution. But defenders of Darwin's theory say that's not the whole story. They point out that new mutations can occur in resistant bacteria that will allow them to recover some of their fitness. These new mutations are known as compensatory mutations. Over time, interestingly, you can find compensatory mutations to increase the, the growth rate. So second mutations occur 
to build the organism back to where it was, but they never get back there completely. According to Minnick, compensatory mutations damage the resistant bacteria in still other ways, again reducing their overall fitness. So you get locked into this genetic condition that never allows you to recover what you lost initially in exposure to that drug. The end result is that antibiotic resistance seems to be a dead end for Darwin's theory. It can't generate the types of complex changes needed for macro evolution to occur. One of the icons of evolution that I wrote about uh, is the four-winged fruit fly. Now, fruit flies normally have two wings and behind those wings are a pair of what are called balancers that vibrate, oscillate rapidly in flight to stabilize the fly's flight. But if you combine three mutations very carefully in a fruit fly embryo, you can produce a fruit fly with four normal looking wings, two pairs. Ed Lewis did this uh, and won the Nobel Prize for it, deservedly, because it, it showed us a lot about the developmental genetics of fruit flies. In terms of evolution, however, it shows us nothing because the second pair of wings has no muscles. It's dead. It's like having a small plane with an extra pair of wings hanging off the tail, trying to take off from a runway. And so the four-winged fruit fly is actually a cripple. And it turns out, this is why the, the icon is important, even though it's not as common in textbooks as the other icons. What's interesting is we have many cases of mutations that produce minor biochemical changes, such as antibiotic resistance in bacteria. But we do not know of a single anatomical mutation that's beneficial to the organism. People have mutated fruit flies every way they can. They've done the same with zebrafish. They've done the same with uh, a roundworm called uh, C. elegans. Uh, they've done the same almost completely now with mice. It's called saturation mutagenesis. There's only three possible outcomes we now know. If you mutate an organism and watch it develop from an embryo, there's only three possible outcomes. If you mutate a fruit fly, you either get a normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly. That's it. Those are the only three possibilities. You don't create new organs or body plants. You don't even change the species. Now, as we know, ordinary fruit flies have only two wings. The four-winged fruit fly has not only its regular set of wings, but a second set of wings just next to that. And the caption or the text will say, this is evidence for um, the process of evolution, that mutations affect the process of development, and you can get anomalies as interesting as a four-winged fruit fly. Gene duplications and rearrangements of genes can indeed produce very sudden genetic changes. Um, they can produce changes that are as dramatic as a fruit fly that suddenly has an extra pair of wings or has an antenna where its eye was supposed to be. And I give those exa as examples not of evolution, but of the ability of the genetic toolkit to produce very sudden and dramatic changes in an organism's morphology. Well, it turns out that the four-winged fruit fly is actually a very poor example of Darwinian evolution, certainly. If you're going to change animal form, you've got to do it in a way that the organism can survive and can pass on those new changes. We don't have examples of these kinds of large-scale changes. It's almost as if the fruit fly says, if you want me to exist at all, I better have two eyes, six legs, two wings, and so on. I better have more or less the normal form.